All righty. Wow. So you can go ahead and be seated. Um, how many people have never heard that song before? I have never heard that song before. <laughs> so it was interesting because normally I would uh, pick out the specific songs uh, to play. And uh, normally I try and I pick uh, songs that people know. Uh, but tonight the Lord changed things up and he said, I want you to just let me pick the songs. And both those I have never heard before. I mean, had you guys, anyone here never heard both of those before? Yeah, and so, but the second one was so, um, so amazing because the Lord and the Holy Spirit were speaking to me. Let me grab her. Because the Lord was saying that's exactly what is uh, going on when we do these sessions is um, that our hearts have been hurt and our hearts get hurt because we have people in the world and the people in the world, you know, do things and say things uh, to us that hurt us. And so therefore, that's how the enemy works. And uh, I'm not sure. And uh, so what, what uh, deliverance really is, is about basically forgiving, forgiving those that hurt us. And uh, I'll say this. So I was in, uh, a couple weeks ago, I was in Gillette, Wyoming. I drove to the Badlands. Who's here ever been to the Badlands? They're very bad. <laughs> <laughs> they are dusty. They are dirty. Uh, they're in South Dakota near the uh, uh, Mount Rushmore. And so I'd never seen it before. I've been to Mount Rushmore once before, like last year. So I drove over there to the Badlands and drove through it. I'm like, how bad are these Badlands, you know? Well, my car was getting like filthy and dirty. Well, I come back to, I to Idaho, uh, no, not Idaho, it was Gillette, Wyoming. And I had to go get my car washed. And as I'm going through the car wash, the Holy Spirit starts to speak to me. Because I was telling the Lord, I'm like, gosh, it'd be nice to just wash your car once and be done the rest of your life. You know, how many times we have to keep washing our cars? Now, here it probably rains all the time, right, you know? So I don't know how often you guys wash your cars here, but uh, I know, like, in the dusty, like, I was in Kennewick, Washington before here, and it's normally deserty there, so, you know, they have a lot of uh, dust and dirt there. So, anyway, as I am telling the Lord that, I'm like, why can't we just wash our car once? And he said, yeah. He goes, it's just like in life. He said... You go out to the Badlands, you know, there's a lot of bad things and people that are being affected by bad spirits all over the world. And they're going to say things and do things to cause you to take an offense and be angry. And then remember the voice and the tones and stuff that they say things to us. And you have to continually forgive because there's going to be new Badlands that you're going to come up against, you know, tomorrow, the next day, the next week. And he said, you have to be in a continual state of forgiveness. Because if you don't, then the enemy has a legal right to keep on reminding you, tormenting you, and you oftentimes hear the, the, the enemy pretty strongly. And the other thing he said you have to do is you have to continue to be in a state of keeping yourself humble because the enemy wants to keep you, get you puffed up and have pride and so forth. And, and so after he gave me that analogy, I was like, oh, that's good. Oh, well, that's really good. And, and he did it all the way through the car wash. So by the time I was done with the car wash, you know, I'd gotten my, da my lesson downloaded to me. And I was like, that's amazing, Lord. That's so simple, but yet it's so true. Because, you know, a lot of times I, we want to think, well, gee, you know, I've gone through deliverance in the past. I'm good to go. Well, there's going to be a new person, you know, could be in church, could be your family, you know, could be at work, you know, wherever, that it's going to say something, it's going to do something to hurt you. And if we don't say, okay, I'm going to forgive them, I'm not going to take an offense, then the enemy's going to keep working on us and keep reminding us, they were so bad to you, you should never forgive them, they were awful. And you may say, okay, I choose to forgive them, but yet in your heart, you still harbor some resentment and some residual from that. And the enemy wants to keep reminding you. In fact, I'm going to probably be talking about this tomorrow on my Facebook Live, is to... To think about how many times does someone say something to you, maybe a discouraging word or sentence or whatever, and then it replays in your mind over and over and over again. And so what I've learned is that we need to take every thought captive, like it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, 3 through 6. You know, why would Paul say that if some of our thoughts were not our own, that were coming from the enemy, you know? You know, when I grew up, I was, you know, I grew up, I, I went to a Church of God, then a Presbyterian Church, then a more Pentecostal, then Assembly of God. And they were all 
mainly saying that, well, Christians can't have demons. But then I started seeing, you know, the divorce rate was about the same in the church as it was outside the church and the behaviors and stuff. And I was like, huh. I go, this isn't lining up with my theology. I go, um, maybe they can. Maybe they can still have, maybe the enemy still torments, you know, tries to whisper to the Christians. Why would he give up, you know? I'm like, I'm pretty sure that, yeah. I go, that's why Paul said that we're supposed to take every thought captive because some of the thoughts are coming from the enemy. So after um, going through some experiences myself, which is kind of why I'm doing what I'm doing now, um, the Lord started revealing to me that, yeah, you know, the enemy is not going to give up. He's going to continue to try to torment us with our thoughts if we don't take the thoughts captive. But the, the challenge is, is discerning what thoughts are from the enemy and what thoughts are from us. You know, what thoughts are coming from the Lord? You know, those are the three different places. So it was about two weeks ago the Lord gave me some revelation um, when I was in Boise. Who here has been to Boise? I had never been to Boise. I wanted to go there because they have blue field uh, for their uh, football team. And so I got to see the blue, they call it Smurf Turf. If you, so I'm, I'm, a, I'm a big college football fan and college basketball fan. So. so I went there and I was getting my oil changed and the Lord said, hey Nelson, guess how many thoughts a day an average person has? And I was like, huh, I don't know. I go, off the top of my head, I would guess maybe a thousand thoughts a day. And so I, I, I actually did a Google search and the National Science Foundation said it's anywhere between 50 to 80,000 thoughts per day. And I'm like, you're kidding me. <laughs> I'm like, that's a heck of a lot of thoughts, Lord. And he's like, yeah, I keep reading. So I kept reading on and it said that 80% of the thoughts that the average person has are negative and 95% are repetitive. Does that sound like what the enemy would do to us? Yes. And what was interesting, because again, I, I come from a background, um, I grew up on a farm, I was in Indiana, went to Purdue University, um, sold software to banks, and then I managed relationships between the core processors that manage all the data for the banks in the United States. And we had a compliance company I worked for, and then I transferred into a company that was an internet banking company. Um, and the guy that actually was my boss lives now in Portland. He actually grew up in Portland, so I got to actually see him yesterday, which was cool, because now we get to talk about God stuff instead of business stuff. Um, but I, I, I'm a stat guy, and so when, when the Lord took me and transferred me from business into doing ministry, um, what I noticed when I started getting people set freed from the torment is they noticed the number of thoughts that they had came way down. Because instead of getting pinged by all these thoughts from the enemy, it's like now it was like their own thought or it was from the Lord. And so how many thoughts does a person have when they go through one of these deliverance sessions? Um, I don't know exactly, you know, but uh, I would think it was would be no more than, you know, 5,000 maybe a day versus 50,000 know, and maybe even less than that. Um, so like if I'm driving down the road, you know, I don't hear anything. Now, in the past, when I'm driving down the road occasionally, there could be a thought coming in from the enemy that might be an obvious thought, such as, you should just take the car and drive it into the car, or into the tree, and end your life. You know, where'd that thought come from? Probably not from God, probably not from you, probably from the enemy. Those are kind of obvious thoughts. But there's a lot of subtle thoughts that if we don't understand and don't take them captive, will cause us strife and arguing with people that are close to us, like our spouse, like our children. And uh, I have some experience with that. I know what that's like. And I started to pay attention to my thoughts back in 2009 as the Lord was kind of speaking to me really for the first time. So it's been about 10 years that I've heard consistently from the Lord. And he told me to keep um, thinking about my thoughts before I would speak out words. He said, what will happen is the enemy will flood us with these negative stuff to, to basically try and get us into strife with those closest to us, with our spouse, with our children, with those at work, get us into fear, get us into anger, taking offense, all these things that are all enemy territory. And if we don't discern it, we're gonna be like a little puppet where the enemy says, speaks into our mind and says, you know what? You know, your husband's just like your dad. You couldn't trust your dad. You can't trust your husband. You know, don't listen to him. And then the words come out. 
And the same thing, you know, a husband gets a, a thought coming in, you know what, your wife's just like your mom. She just controls you all the time, tells you what to do. Don't let her do that to you. And then you start to speak words out. And then all of a sudden, World War III breaks out. And you're fighting, striving, and arguing, and the enemy's laughing the whole time, thinking, ha, 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 I just stole their peace. And it may last for a day, two days, three days before you get it back because you're still striving and, and bickering and so forth. And the same thing can happen at work and it can happen at church. You know, especially we see this in church where there could be gossip, there could be lies, there could be manipulation. All of these things are enemy territory that the enemy's planting on us. And especially parents with children. I've noticed this now, I've, uh, I've, I've ministered people all over the world um, since 2015. A very short period of time, but we've seen tens of thousands of people that have gone through this and uh, life changes and healings and no more striving and fighting and arguing and marriages saved and, and, uh, and miracles that have happened. So I've seen it. Um, and the biggest thing that people have told me is once they've gone through this, they're like, you know what? I thought I was a Christian before. But man, now I think I'm really a Christian <laughs> because my fruit is really good now. You know, in the past, I used to do some behaviors that really probably weren't too good. I didn't want anybody to know about them. You know, I want to keep it all quiet, hush, hush, you know. But truth be known, now that I can be honest, you're like, yeah, I wasn't really a nice person to be around. You know, I was controlling. I was more manipulative. Uh, I would justify some white lies here and there. I would be a little prideful and all this stuff. And, uh, and, and we've seen a lot of people that had like back pain and neck pain and a hard time sleeping, couldn't remember their dreams and uh, couldn't get along, you know. And then the, the, the enemy would tell them that it's everybody else's fault. It's never theirs. And so the person that's closest to them, you know, ends up having like, really, you know, look in the mirror. It's at your, you know. But what I noticed is over the last several years is oftentimes the enemy is going to use the parents to hurt the children. And then when the children get hurt, the children start to take an offense and get angry at the parents. And then the enemy is telling the parents to blame the kids. You know, it's all your fault, you're a mess, da 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 instead of looking in the mirror at them and saying, maybe, maybe I contributed to that. So then all of a sudden, the hearts of the fathers and the sons are departed. They don't like each other, and the mothers and the, and the daughters and so forth. And then when people go through set, getting set free and, and delivered, then all of a sudden they can actually realize that maybe I did contribute to some of this dysfunction and maybe I should own it because the spirit of pride, which is ultimately the spirit of Leviathan, it's in Job 41. You know, I'd never heard of Leviathan in my life. You know, I didn't have, have any pastor that ever preached on that because they didn't really understand it. And I didn't understand it until I went through what I went through. And then the Lord was telling me about the spirit of Jezebel and the spirit of Leviathan and how prevalent that it is in striving and fighting and arguing and a lot of stuff that's not good. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna tonight is to simply describe these characteristics of these spirits in people. And uh, we're also gonna talk, talk about Ahab, we're gonna talk about Legion. We're also gonna talk about breaking off witchcraft curses because the Lord showed me there's about 1.5 million witches that go to church, you know, and they're in the church and they wanna pray for people, but they're not the way they should be. You know, they were hurt by father wounds or mother wounds or sexual violations. Those are the three main reasons of how people get hurt. Of course, they can be hurt from people outside the family, from doctors to pastors to, you know, teachers, lawyers, anyone that's a person. You know, that's how it comes in. If somebody either says something or does something to hurt us, or we may say something and do something as well that we have to take ownership for. Um, so... Anyway, and then at the end, we're going to take authority in Jesus' name. We're going to take authority. We're going to kick out anything that is of the enemy from us. Because if we have anything that has a legal right, we don't want that in us. We're not going to have... I mean, the biggest thing that people say, well, how do you know if you've really gotten set free and delivered? I'm like, well, you're going to have peace most of the time. You know, I have peace all the time. I don't get fighting, striving, arguing. I don't get worried. I don't take an offense. I love everybody. Um, so the enemy's not able to get through, you know, I mean, if he, if he does, he may get through with a couple words, but I can shut it down really quickly. Where in the past I couldn't, I thought every thought that came in, I would just receive it, you know, and let the whole sentence be spoken or the whole paragraph. And then if it's coming from the enemy, then I'm going to be not at peace. I'm going to be taking offense. I'm going to be angry. I'm going to blame. I'm going to do things I shouldn't be doing. That's not going to give me good fruit. And, and the other thing is, uh, when you're delivered is you're going to be much more humble. 
which is what the Lord really wants. He wants us to be a humble man or woman. The pride, you think about Lucifer got kicked out of heaven because of his pride. You know, and there's all, and we'll go through some Bible verses too about how the Lord does not like pride on, on any of us. We need to be humble. And most of us, if we've not gone through deliverance from the spirit of pride, it's hard for us to see because the enemy's gonna block us in our mind, telling us, wow, well, you don't have any pride. You're the most humblest man on earth. You're the most humblest woman on earth, you know? And so then you don't see it. So I'm gonna actually describe a little bit of characteristics of what pride looks like, um, because it does kind of stink, you know, to high heaven. The Lord doesn't like that, so. Um, so I, and, and when I do these, it's always different. You know, tonight it's different than what it was, with what I've ever done before. In fact, that song really plays into this because what happens is we do have our hearts that get hurt in a myriad of ways, you know, and it could be a subtle pain. Maybe your dad or your mom worked a lot. And so you might've felt a little rejection because the enemy's whispering to you saying, your dad doesn't love you or your mom doesn't love you. But maybe that's not even true, but you're believing the enemy's lies. Or it could be that you had a dad or a mom or a stepmom or a stepdad or anyone else that hurt you and hurt you deeply and betrayed you. You know, we, we know people that have gone through sexual violations and, you know, molestations, incest, um, experimentation. You know, it's hard not to be affected in a way sexually anymore because it's just so prevalent that's out there. Um, and, and when that happens, our souls get wounded. Our souls are our mind, will, and emotions. And so, um, that's why we see a lot of people in the church that you know, are, are still struggling in their marriages and they are struggling with children um, is because there's been effects to us and we've not effectively gone through true, truly forgiving everyone that hurt us. Because the enemy is going to keep reminding us, you know, those of us that have gone through the, some more, more pain than ever, you know, well, the enemy is going to keep reminding us of all those bad things over and over and over again and they torment you in your mind. And so... Uh, expect when we're done with tonight that you're going to have peace in your thoughts and that you're going to feel lighter. A lot of people feel lighter. Um, and some of you may be yawning. That's kind of the, the, the biggest manifestations I've seen when I go through all this yawning. You know, that's cool. I like yawning. You know, nobody does anything weird because we take authority in Jesus' name. We don't allow that. We don't tolerate that. I never, I wouldn't be doing this. I couldn't do it in a corporate setting if if you know, people you know, would do some things that were weird, because I'm not a weird person. You know? <laughs> My grandmother actually did deliverance, and she was kind of weird, because she was affected by these spirits. She actually didn't get delivered. She was married to her husband. He used to call her uh, mother. You know? He had the spirit of Ahab, and we've described the characteristics of Ahab. Because what you see in about 85, 90% of marriages is a person that struggles more with the Jezebel spirit married to someone that has the Ahab spirit. Now you can fluctuate, you can have all three of these we're gonna describe, Jezebel, Leviathan, and Ahab. Most of us do, I did. But you'll have a default to one or the other. If your normal day-to-day -day may be the Ahab versus the Jezebel. So again, don't worry about the name Jezebel. A lot of people think, oh, that's such an evil name. I'm like, yeah, why couldn't they call her Ashley? You know, my daughter's name is Ashley. She's like, dad, don't call him Ashley. I'm like, why? It'd be so much easier for people to receive it, you know? <laughs> but uh, <laughs> anyways, um, so, I'm going to read some characteristics of, of these spirits, and what will, what's interesting is, and when the Lord gave me the revelation on all this, I mean, and I started to actually, like, I could talk to people on the streets and in church and stuff within five minutes, and all of a sudden, light bulbs are going off in their head, like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, you know, you're describing me to a T. How do you know me? I'm like, because it's the spirit. It, it's the same in everybody that has it. You know, we're on to its game now. This is, it's a real thing. You know, Christians can be tormented by the enemy. Yes, they can. And, uh, and this is how you get un... Because after the Lord explained to me all this, then I asked, well, okay, if I'm going to be helping people get set free, you know, all over the world, then I need to know how to get them free and delivered. How do you do that? And he explained to me. He said, this is how you have to do it. They have to choose to forgive all those that hurt them, and they have to mean it with their hearts. Because he said, you know, if they don't mean it, like if, if they said, well, I've chosen to forgive my dad or my mom for hurting me um, or a spouse or an ex-spouse. Like, okay, well, what if they walked in the door right now? How would you feel? Would you be rising up in a little anger? Would you want to go over and punch them? You know, because if you 
did, you probably have not forgiven them yet. And that gives the enemy the legal right to keep tormenting you. Oh, I never thought about that. Yeah, I want to punch him every time I see him. I'm like, okay, well, then you probably are not going to forgive. And, and how the Lord showed me is like, well, I'm like, well, how do I get him free then? He said, well, he goes, he showed me the example in the movie, The Shack. Anyone seen The Shack? So I didn't see it at first because it was like really controversial. And the Lord said, you need to watch it. So I ended up watching it actually three times. And in the premise of it, it was the guy was hurt by his father. It was like beaten up in a shack. And so he was really angry at God, which a lot, that's how the enemy works, is oftentimes you get hurt by your father or mother, step parent, sexual violations, whatever. And then the enemy keeps reminding us so that we get angry at them and, and blame them. And oftentimes we blame God, even though we come into the church and we're wounded, we wanna, we wanna get help. So he was angry with his dad. And so they ended up uh, putting him in like in a different world. And uh, of course they had God be a, a woman because that way he wouldn't be as angry at God because she was a woman versus a man. But ultimately they had like an angel put him inside of a cave and said, okay, you're so angry at God, you decide now who goes to heaven and hell, you be God. He's like, I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that. He's like, well, you're going to do that. And so they showed him videos of different people and like drug dealers and murderers. And it's like, hell, 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 hell. Well, then they showed a little boy, like seven, eight years old. He's like, well, that little boy shouldn't go to hell. He's a little innocent boy. And then they pan back and they showed his father beating him up. He said, that little boy was your dad. And all of a sudden it hit him and he's like, oh, and now he could understand and appreciate that, oh my gosh, my dad went through a lot of bad stuff. And that's why he did to me what his dad did to him. And that's exactly what we're dealing with in our generations that the whole world has been going through is our dad or our mom normally is the first people that end up hurting us. Now there, there may be some that, you know, and again, we live in a fallen world, we all sin. So even though we might be the best dad or mom that we possibly could be, we're still gonna say things and do things that the, the ch children can be hurt by. Um, and not all the time. We may be really good, great parents and stuff, but then they end up getting hurt by somebody else. Maybe they have a sleepover. I remember one man that had a sleepover at the pastor's house and the pastor's son touched him sexually inappropriately and that affected him the rest of his life. So there's little things that we don't even share. I had one man that his sister, when he was, sister was 15, he was eight, she, she touched him inappropriately. And ever since then, he heard the thoughts of the enemy telling him he couldn't trust women. So he married a woman, and for 20 years, all he had was strife because the enemy kept telling him he couldn't tell, trust his wife. So he would call home every day to check on her to make sure she wasn't out having an affair. And it was wearing on their marriage. But when he went through deliverance, he didn't hear that anymore. He didn't call her anymore. He was at peace. He's like his whole life changed. He actually had pains on the left side of his body that got healed instantly as well. So, um, so ultimately what happens is when we can understand that everybody that hurts us has been hurt themselves, we can then give them grace and say, okay, I forgive them. You know, nobody's perfect. And some people hurt us way more deeper than others, which means that they were hurt somehow pretty deeply by somebody else. So when you can actually see it from the Lord's perspective, then we can give them grace and say, okay, I forgive them and then mean it, truly mean it. So that's part of the deliverance process. The other part is humbling our own selves from the pride and taking ownership for what we've done. Because the enemy doesn't want us to do that. And he was like, oh, you're perfect. You know, you didn't do anything wrong. It's everybody else. So if we can humble ourselves, because if we have pride, you know, that's not good. Because the pride will cause us not to see ourselves. It'll, it'll excuse behavior on ourselves, or it will say things such as, you know, I didn't, I didn't do that bad thing or say that bad thing yesterday. Or the, or the week before, and you'll deny it when you actually did. But it will convince you that, no, 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 I didn't. if you deny it, then they can't prove it, you know? It's like, ah. Oh. So that, those are the two main things that stop a person from getting freed. And uh, if, you know, if you can do that tonight, and again, it's, it's up to you. It's a uh, participant. Uh, um, it, it's, de it's depending on you, essentially. It's just like Jesus, he could not get delivered those that were the evil Pharisees. Their hearts were wicked and they were evil. They had a free will. You know, he could have presented, you know, he did. He presented the gospel, you know, as much as he could to everybody, but they hated him. You know, they did, they wanted to kill him. So it's just like the same thing with what the Lord's having me do is I'm going to share the truth and it's up to you to receive if you, yeah, this does make sense. And I think that's true. Okay. 
Um, and then when we go through the prayers at the end, if you mean it, then I've seen it a pretty high percentage of people that will get delivered the first time. But then there's also a percentage of people that may take longer. It may take weeks. It may take months because the Holy Spirit will keep speaking to you gently. Because I've, I've had some people that have gone through this like more than seven or eight times and they yawn like every time. It's because there are some other people maybe that they have gotten offended by that they're not willing to forgive yet. And the Holy Spirit gives them time and reminds them when it's when they're ready and said, you still have some anger towards this person from when you were in the whatever, fourth grade or fifth grade, and you've not truly forgiven them yet. So that's why you may have to, it's a, it could be a process, you know, so just to let you know. Um, my goal is to try to let the Holy Spirit, you know, obviously flow and hit every area in everyone's life so that we can all do this at once. And we do see a high percentage of people that get delivered. We also see a good percentage of people that get healed of things. Um, back pain, neck pain, insomnia, headaches, you know, fibromyalgia, um, you've even seen bipolar. You know, when you get delivered from these spirits tormenting you, we, you're a different person. You know, a lot of people say, well, that's just a personality disorder. No, the root issue is it's a demonic disorder <laughs> because they're hearing the voice of the enemy. Now, it can affect physical things, can affect chemical imbalances and things like that, yes. But to get to the root issue is deliverance is what, the, the, is, is, is what we see that works, you know, and uh, it's amazing. You know, I've seen so many people, so many families, so many couples. Um, in fact, I was in, uh, what was I at? Billings, Billings, Montana, at a Messianic uh, Jewish church. And this is the second time I was there. And the pastor was like, the first time I came, he said they had more healings that took place that one night than they had seen the previous 12 years. And so I came back there to do a deliverance, and then I actually did a training the next day. And uh, there was a couple that he saw, I guess like a couple weeks later after the deliverance, and they were, they were on the verge of divorce. And now they're holding hands, and they're like school kids. They're in love with each other because they don't hear the voices anymore telling them to fight and strive and blame and all this stuff. There's another guy that he came and he doesn't even look the same. I mean, I have so many pictures I can show you of people that the before and the after because their countenance changes. You know, it's, it's interesting because, you know, I can look out in the audience and I can, you know, you can tell, you know, people that are being hurt by the enemy because oftentimes they're not smiling. <laughs> they're angry. They're tormented, you know. And, and I've seen, you know, I, people are like, I am a Christian and I love Jesus. And I'm like, gee, uh, your face doesn't show me that, you know. But of course, if you're tormented, you're not going to be happy, you know. And then when people get set free, it's like those that aren't set free yet, they get, they're mad because they're like, how dare you be happy, you know. You need to be mad like me, you know. And I've seen that, you know. I've seen like uh, where you've got a person that gets set free and then their mom or dad's still not set free yet. And so they're madder than all get out because now the, their, their child's happy. And they're like, you can't be happy. You have to be a miserable Christian like me. It's like, uh, no, I don't want that, you know. That's why Jesus, when he came, he said that he was going to, uh, he didn't, you know, he came for essentially division between father and, and son and mother and uh, daughter, mother-in-law. Because why? Because those that choose Christ aren't going to have the enemy in them anymore. And, uh, and again, what we see is those that are even in the church that have, that have chosen Christ, they still need deliverance, you know. Um, and because when they go through true forgiveness and then true repentance, then, oh my gosh, they're a different person. They can hear the Lord more clearly than ever before. They have dreams. I mean, who doesn't want to have dreams that you can remember that are good dreams, that are like prophetic dreams? I have about two to three dreams every night. I don't remember everyone, but I remember those that are specific that the Lord wants me to. But I can't wait to go to bed because if I'm bad, I'm going to have some dreams that are really cool. Where I've, I've had a lot of people that said, you know, before they went through deliverance, they're like, you know what, I don't think I have dreams. You know, well, the enemy kind of steals that from you. Oftentimes, the enemy is going to steal the, the sleep so that you don't sleep well. So you keep waking up throughout the night, you know, insomnia, and you take medication, and, and some medication has side effects, and that's not good. So, um, you know, I have, in fact, uh, I got delivered. It was uh, back in 2008. The Lord did it. Like, even I was oblivious, really, to it. I became a different person, though. I became more gentle, more loving, more patient than what I was before. I had more characteristics of the spirit of Jezebel, Leviathan, you know, than I do now. Um, I was still more the Ahab, but I still had Jezebel and Leviathan spirit. Um, so anyway, when I got delivered, um, I started learning about my authority in Christ as well. And, and I had some physical stuff that came on me. I used to, you know, go to doctors all the time whenever I had pain. 
Well, then the Lord started changing my thinking, saying, you know what, Nelson? He goes, once you start learning your authority, once you take away all these legal rights of the enemy, because you can walk in the divine health that I really want all my people to walk in, but you have to, to do your own homework. And so I had the enemy come against me to try to fight me. I had a back pain that was really bad, a disc that popped out. I had a bulge the size of a golf ball. I had a toothache that was really bad. But through all that, I saw healings, some of it instantly, a lot of it progressively. But now I've gone 10 years without taking anything, Tylenol, ibuprofen. Um, last time I had a headache, it was in 2010. And it was because I was driving uh, a vehicle that I'd never driven before and it was a little more stressful, but I prayed and it went away. But I used to have headaches all the time. I used to have scoliosis. Um, I couldn't play basketball my seventh grade basketball year. And what I've learned is the spirit of Leviathan will wrap around a person's spine and it will twist and cause back pain and neck pain. You know, not, not saying that everybody's gonna have scoliosis that has it, but it does do damage because I had a healing room in 2015 and people kept coming in. As a standard, the Lord said, take people through the deliverance. You know, do it in a normal way. Nobody's gonna vomit or slither like a snake. You know, you gotta be normal. Because I'm like, I'm a business guy. I'm not gonna do weird, God. If this gets weird, and I've seen weird. You know, we probably all have seen weird, you know. That's what the enemy wants to do is to get people to get scared and all that stuff, so. But uh, the, the most that I've seen common is yawning, maybe burping, you know, that's pretty much it. And so people came through and I described this for them and they're like, oh my gosh, what you're saying is true. I have this symptom, this symptom, this symptom. And so then I give the reasons why and then we actually went through the prayers to get delivered and we saw a whole bunch of people getting healed. And they're like, oh my gosh, this is incredible. So, so here I go, I'm gonna read the characteristics and you just listen. In fact, I'll say this, there, so there's a woman, Holy Spirit kind of reminds me of things as I go. Oh, there's a woman, her testimony's on my YouTube channel, uh, Nelson Schumann, and she's from Indiana, and the enemy was telling her, she was hurt when she was growing up, um, some, some abuse she, she went through for, I don't know, eight to 10 years, and she married her husband. Her husband had the Ahab spirit, she had the Jezebel spirit, she didn't know. Um, and the enemy kept telling her to blame her husband. It's always the husband's fault. It's always her husband's fault. So she divorced him. Then she got remarried to him. And then she was going to divorce him again. And she kept lying to people about his behavior. And he wasn't the way she was describing it. But the enemy was convincing her that, oh, it's all his fault. So she came to one of these meetings only because the person was driving a nice car. <laughs> and she wanted to ride in the car. So she came. But she said that when she came, like she said all her life um, since she went through the trauma, she kept having racing thoughts and stuff. Her, her, she couldn't stop her thoughts. She said, when I came there and I was sitting in the audience, when you were speaking, it was like the Lord slowed everything down and I could hear everything you were speaking. And then when you were describing the characteristics, you were describing me to a T <laughs> and I received it. And then she got delivered and then she went home and she was a different person. Her husband's like, wow, who are you? <laughs> I've been waiting for this, you know, our whole lives, you know? And, and then ultimately she went off her medication. She was on some very strong antidepressant medication and um, some other medication. And so she got healed from all that. Oh my gosh, you know, she became a different person and, and, and her personality changed. So a lot of people think about that, the personalities, people say, well, it's just a personality disorder. I'm like, no, you get rid of the root cause being a spiritual disorder. <laughs> and guess what? Your personality changes, you're, you're happy. So. Um, so anyway, I'm gonna, and I can show you pictures too. They're just very dramatic. Because what happens is before and the after, the after pictures of people, they look at peace. They look pure. You know, they look um, sweet. The childlike innocence that was stolen from them when they were younger is restored. You know, they actually have a lot of fun. You know, I have a lot of fun wherever I go. Today I went to the beach. Get this, I went to, I, I went to the beach Friday and I, um, I love to go adventuring because the Lord has me go all over the United States and Canada right now. And so I've never been to the beach in Oregon. I've been to the beach in California. So I drive out there Friday and I go to Ebola State Park. And as soon as I park there, I'm all excited to get out. And guess what? There's like 40 mile an hour wind starts blowing rain at like horizontally. Uh, yeah, horizontally. And I'm like, okay, well, 
hopefully it'll be done in like five minutes, you know? So I'm waiting, waiting, it's 10 minutes, then it's 15 minutes, then it's 20 minutes. So I get on my phone and look, I'm like, oh my gosh, it's gonna come forever. I'm like, I don't have forever, so I guess maybe I can see it another time. So I wasn't planning to see it. Well, today the Lord said, I want you to go back out there. I'm gonna not have it rain. I'm like, really? I'm like, it rains like all the time in Oregon, Lord. <laughs> you know, but just pray, take authority. I'm like, okay. So I go there, I went to Ebola State Park, and I was like, wow, no rain. I'm like, oh, this is beautiful. So I took some pictures. I'm like, oh, I love, I love beauty. I love to go for walks. And then um, I decided to go to eat at a cafe. And I, I Google searched. I found a cafe that was um, in, on Hemlock Street, if you know what that's at. It's like south of Ebola. And so I drove down there and uh, walked. Actually, I, I, as soon as I got a parking space, I decided to walk. I'm like, wow, this is really close to the beach. I'm gonna go to the beach. So I walked to the beach and all of a sudden I see these giant rocks. I'm like, oh my gosh. So I took a picture of the giant rocks and I sent it to a friend and the friend wrote me back and said, oh my gosh, that's the Goonie Rocks. I'm like, Goonie Rocks? I'm like, are you sure? Like, not, surely that's not the Goonie Rocks. And, I, I've already seen that movie, like half of it, and, and I, I vaguely remember some giant rocks there. So then she's like, she did a real quick search and she sent back, that's the Goody rocks. And I'm like, ah, you know, haystack rock, that's what they're talking about. And I'm, I'm like, oh my gosh, you're right, this is the Goody. So then I go back to eat and then I get back on the beach to go for my walk. And as I'm walking, this dog, it's like almost like it emerges from the ocean, starts to run towards me with a stick in its mouth and it drops it at my feet. I'm like, wow, you've been waiting for me. Here I am. You know, so I pick it up and I throw it. And I'm like, this is awesome, you know, because I don't have a dog anymore. I don't have a house anymore. I don't have an apartment. I travel full time. You know, I don't have a home. I live oftentimes in other people's homes, <laughs> but also in uh, hotels. And I don't have a dog anymore. So I got to play catch with or fetch with this dog for like, I don't know, five or six, seven minutes. And I was like, this is awesome. I mean, it was the friendliest dog. It was like it was waiting for me. And then I didn't know where the owner, I mean, I didn't see an owner. As I walked on, the dog was like, it was gone. And I'm like, oh my gosh, was that just for me, God? I'm like, that's awesome, you know? So what, what, I've, what I've seen and sensed is the Lord, when people go through deliverance, they have fun. I, I did a Facebook Live teaching saying, people who get delivered have more fun. And I was joking about how blondes, they always say, have more fun. But I'm like, well, delivered blondes have more fun, you know? <laughs> blondes that aren't delivered aren't gonna have as much fun, you know? And that's true. So people that get delivered, they're like, I'm happier, I'm smiling, I don't hear the voices. I don't hear 80,000 voices every day. Now I hear, you know, a thousand voices and they're from the Lord or they're from, you know? So it's amazing the differences, so anyways. I have fun doing what I'm doing, um, even though I'm homeless. But and you do have some homeless here. I saw them in Portland. So, <laughs> um, so anyways, in fact, there's a, uh, there's a friend of mine. He lives not too far. He lives in Salem, and he actually has gone to the homeless, and he's actually taken them to these prayers, and they got some of them have gotten delivered, and they're like, "You have amazing revelation." <laughs> he's like, "No, it's just you know, you've had father wounds and mother wounds and sexual violations," and, and they're like, "Yes." All right, so here we go. So I'm letting the Holy Spirit reveal to you, you know, okay, does this, do I have some of these characteristics? You have to be honest. If you lie, that's cheating and it's not gonna work. So we have to be honest. Okay, this is describing the spirit of Jezebel. And Jezebel, um, she, was, um, she was basically uh, the king of Sidon um, uh, and then the Phoenicians. She was his um, daughter. And he basically, essentially, like, was sacrificing her to the enemy, um, Baal, Baal worship and so forth. So she was set up for failure, you know, from the beginning. And they actually, I mean, she wanted to marry into the, uh, you know, the Jewish people to actually taint them and, and take advantage of the blessings that, that they were having and actually come against God's prophets and kill God's prophets. And so she ends up marrying Ahab. And then she ends up killing the prophets. And the prophets, of course, uh, Elijah was a prophet, and so Elijah had to, you know, hide, hide for his life so he wouldn't die. Uh, but her goal, that spirit's goal now, because even though she died, her spirit's still affecting people today, is designed specifically to get into the churches and shut down churches or stop churches from growing. 
you know, or to not let the Holy Spirit flow, the pure Holy Spirit, to try to taint it, maybe to try to counterfeit it and so forth, to act all sweet and nice, but yet do things that are not godly and not pure. And then the Ahabs that marry them typically will tolerate them. You know, Ahab, and I'll, I'll describe the characteristics here, um, but that's really what the Jezebel is. In 1 Kings, 2 Kings, they also talk about Jezebel in Revelations, Revelations 2, 18 through 23, the church of Thyatira, which it said that, uh, you know, the church of Thyatira, they would tolerate Jezebel in teaching. And the Lord's in the process of that right now is cleaning up the church because there's a lot of people that struggle with the Jezebel spirit in the church that are teaching, that are in leadership. That's the goal. It wants to get into leadership and power so it can actually control people. But we see it in everyday life, people that are married, you know, that have the spirit. So I'm just going to describe the characteristics because the characteristics are the same in the spirit. Now, there are different levels where if a person's been hurt really, really deeply in their life, they could have a much stronger of all these characteristics of the spirit of Jezebel than those that have been hurt maybe just a little bit. So, um, so here we go. Jezebel causes us to have fear and anxiety because when we were hurt, that's when it first came in. The enemy starts to remind us of all that. You can't be, you can't trust your dad. You can't trust your mom. You know, all these things. It keeps reminding you. You're like, yeah, 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 yeah. So therefore you better not let anybody tell you what to do because they're going to let you down just like your dad or your mom or whomever else might have hurt you. So you're going to suffer from a lot of voices that are going to cause you to fear and have anxiety. It also is going to cause you to want to control other people, which means I want my way, not yours, because I don't trust you, you know, because I couldn't trust my dad or my mom or anyone else that has hurt me. And so if they're going to let me down, then you're going to let me down and I don't trust you. And also they want to control of people because they feel that they will not have to be hurt again if they get their way all the time. You know, um, Jezebel spirits will cause us to be manipulative so that we get our way. You know, and it could be a subtle way where we control people, where we say certain things to make them feel guilty to do what we want them to do. You know, and, and some people are more over, overt about it or they're really obvious. You know, saying things, you know, like saying, you know what? If you don't, um, you know, take me to eat this one restaurant, then we're not going to have intimacy tonight. <gasps> they wouldn't do that. Oh, yes, they would. You know, yeah, oh, yes, they would. That's the spirit, though. That's the spirit. The spirit of Jezebel causes us to be, je or to be jealous, you know, in an unhealthy way. So you may think that, oh, my gosh. Like, I, I've heard this. This is just, I mean, I've seen this a lot is a spouse may say, hey, now let's say, say it's a guy that has the Jezebel spirit. He wants his wife to go work and get a job. But when she starts to work, then all of a sudden the enemy keeps pinging him with thoughts saying, you know what, all the guys are talking to her. You're gonna lose her. <gasps> yeah, you, you gotta quit. You gotta quit, honey. You can't work anymore because all these guys are gonna be you know, flirting with you. And, 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 and some of that could be completely no way. It's a false belief. Some of it could be a percentage. Um, but I've seen that a lot of times. Um, they're jealous. You know, in fact, in my situation, I remember my wife would, um, I would be up at the front and I would get a prophetic word for somebody. People were worshiping. So I would give them that word, whoever it was, man or woman. Well, at the front of most churches, there's more women. <laughs> so the chances of getting a word for a woman are greater. And so I would get, I would get words for both, but uh, oftentimes more with women. And, he, and she would be very jealous. You shouldn't be giving a word, a prophetic word to a woman. That's improper. That's wrong. I'm like, what? I don't think that's wrong. <laughs> like, oh, I'm not hitting on them. I'm giving them a word from the Lord, you know. Um, Jezebel causes a person to demand their way. And they will raise their voice and they will have a tone in order to get their way. And the people that have a relationship with them that struggle with Ahab know they've been trained that, okay, if I'm going to stand up against what she wants, I'm gonna to have to put up with maybe an hour of being lectured or yelled at. So I could save myself a whole hour here if I just give them what they want. And they're used to doing that their whole lives. And oftentimes you see their mom or their dad do that, or their stepfather, stepmother. So they're very demanding, they're, they're very selfish, self-absorbed. There's a lot of sexual impurity and sexual selfishness that goes on. Um, and there's never intimacy in the marriage when it comes to sexual side. Uh, I've, and I've, I've heard from people that when they've gotten delivered, both the husband and the wife, then it's intimacy. 
it's purity. It's really great because now it's like, it's a tender, loving thing that people do together and it brings them closer to the Lord and it brings them closer to each other instead of just being an act that's, you know, you're satisfying someone's, you know, <laughs> uh, physical uh, need. Um, uh, Jezebel causes us to lie and to justify the lies. And, uh, and, and sometimes you may think that, oh my gosh, how could they just flat out lie? And, and, and in some cases, they block out that it was a lie. They're like, oh, no, I didn't lie. This is really true. And it really wasn't true. But they actually believe the lies that they're speaking. And you're like, gee, how do they not know this? Do I have to videotape them 24 hours a day so they can actually see it? Because they'll deny everything that they said or did, like last week. And I know what they said or did. But that spirit's causing them not to take responsibility for anything that's bad. Um, they have a desire for power and leadership, not only in the church, but in corporate America, in businesses, even in schools, you know, hospitals, you name it. Those people that struggle from this, they want to look good, you know, it makes them feel good. Plus they can control more people that way when they're in leadership. It ultimately wants to shut down the true Holy Spirit from flowing. So that's why you see a lot of churches that tolerate the Jezebel spirit is that they will, they will not see much growth once those spirits start to take over. And we see a lot of church splits that happen um, when people go through deliverance and they have a pure, a more pure body, then the churches flow and they grow and it's a good thing. So Jezebel's dominant, intimidating, you know, just like Jezebel, she threatened Elijah. It's going to be just like tomorrow for you, what happened to those male prophets that you killed, you know, today. And so he got afraid and he goes running into a cave. Oftentimes people that struggle with a person that has that spirit wants to run into a cave. They want to die. And ultimately that's what that spirit wants to do is to cause a person to oftentimes slowly die. I've seen a lot of men that have Jezebel married to women that are Ahabs where the women start to get sick in their bodies because they cannot take the constant barrage verbally over and over and over again. And when they end up either getting the husband delivered, then all of a sudden they feel better and all of a sudden they get healed from these things. Or if there's separation that needs to happen, then they feel better as well because they're not constantly getting berated. Um, I've seen the men that are married to women that have Jezebel that they can only tolerate it better, but um, physically, but again, it's not fun to be controlled. I mean, in fact, you feel like uh, an emasculated eunuch, like the eunuchs that worked, you know, for the, in the palace with Jezebel, who ultimately pushed her out and uh, to her demise when Jehu came. Uh, Jezebel will intimidate people. They are rebellious. They don't like to be told what to do. They're critical. They're judgmental. They act assured of themselves, like they know everything but really deep down inside, they're insecure. Um, they cannot stand to be told no. If you tell someone that has Jezebel, no, <laughs> be prepared. They're gonna raise your voice, you're gonna get angry. They may throw something at you. You know, it just depends on how strong that spirit is. They love to provoke people to get them angry. And once that person, you know, can't stand anymore and they stand up for themselves and says, enough, then they're like, pointing the finger at them and say, look how bad that you are. It's all your fault. And you're like, well, wait a minute. I don't think I started this. Oh, yes, you did. And they try to convince it. And normally the person who has Ahabs will back down and say, okay, I'm sorry. Please forgive me for being so bad. <laughs> and they're like, yes. <laughs> um, they enjoy starting arguments, especially if they have like family get-togethers, like holidays. They'll start arguments and then they'll like go to the different room and be like, yes smile like a Cheshire cat, like, ha ha, ha. I got everybody, because that spirit loves to control other people and to get them to lose their peace. I mean, people that have Jezebel never have peace. You, know, you may control everybody, but you'll never have peace in your life until you get delivered. Um, and you'll have constant chatter in your mind. And that's the big part of it. It's like they're tormented constantly. They cannot turn it off. And you know, try and go to bed at night and all these thoughts start flooding in. And then if you finally fall asleep, you normally wake up, you know, midway through. And you don't have good dreams or don't have any dreams. Um, if you work for somebody that has this or you're married to somebody and they tell you what to do, if you don't do it exactly as they would do it, you'll probably hear about it. They'll critique you and you'll just be like, man, I can't even win, you know. <laughs> I 
got the job done, but uh, not the way that they would do it. So oftentimes they are perfectionistic. And I've noticed this with the women more than I have the men that have Jezebel. As they will oftentimes try to get their own children to fight and they'll lie to their children about each other to get their, to get their own siblings so they don't talk to each other. Um, a couple of my best friends, that's what their moms did. And they're like, what mom would do that? I'm like, a mom that's hearing the voice of the enemy that struggles with the Jezebel spirit. Jezebel spirit wants all the attention, so they get jealous if their children are getting along and having a good time. It's like, oh. uh, da, 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 da. And those that have the strongest spirit of Jezebel, the psychological community recognizes them and calls them narcissists. <laughs> and they, they said that there's no hope for narcissists to get you know, free, there's no medication that they can go on to make them better. Well, we have seen some narcissist levels that have gotten delivered but they have to humble themselves, it's not easy. I mean, it may be they have to hear this for five, six months, you know, as the, as the Lord keeps working on them to try to get them to see it. But you see a lot of people that struggle at a pretty high level and they'll blame their spouse, saying, you've got the Jezebel spirit. I'm like, no, I don't, you do. Oh no, no, it's you, it's you, it's you. I see that a lot, so. There's an overt version and a covert version. The overt version will like, really yell and scream and throw knives and glasses and chase you and do a lot of crazy things. Scar your arm with their fingernails and blame you for it. You know, the covert ones are be much more subtle. And we see a lot more covert than we do the overts. Um, so the overts would be considered the narcissist. And then the Jezebel spirit always has this Leviathan spirit. Leviathan's the spirit of pride. It's in Job 41. There actually is like six verses in the Bible that talk about Leviathan. And Isaiah 27, one, there's two verses in Psalms. Um, I, I don't think, I uh, really honestly don't think I ever read Job 41. You know, a lot of times we read Job 42 where all the good stuff comes back to Job, but nobody like ever touches on Job 41 where it talks about Leviathan. Um, and it describes essentially like an alligator. It's got scales, it's got a lot of teeth. It says the scales are its pride. I'm gonna read the last two verses of it because that's really kind of what summarizes it. It says, on earth there is nothing like him, which is made without fear. He beholds every high thing. So he's in charge of every prideful thing. He is king over all the children of pride. So when we struggle with pride, that is the underlying spirit behind it, is this Leviathan spirit. And uh, what does pride look like? Lord has me start to, to read this off so we can understand. Because oftentimes when you're prideful, you don't see it. You know, I didn't really see it in my life. I was thinking, oh, I'm not prideful. I mean, nobody really admits, oh yeah, I'm really prideful. I mean, nobody does that. So, so here's what pride looks like, uh, some of the characteristics of it. Number one, you assume you already know something when someone's teaching you. Like right now. <laughs> I already know that, Nelson. You know, like, shh, you know. <laughs> Number two, seeing yourself as too good to perform certain tasks. I, out of all people, am not going to lower myself to do that. I'm going to manage you, let you do that, and I'll just watch and critique you and criticize you, and you don't do it the way that I would do it. Uh, number three, pride causes us to be too proud to ask for help. Number four, feeling the need to consistently teach people things because you know everything. Five, when you talk about yourself a lot, so your accomplishments, your education, your title, your position, your financial status. I used to do that a lot. I used to like, oh my gosh, I am so proud of myself, you know? <laughs> Number six, thinking you are better than others who are different or less fortunate. Number seven, when you disregard the advice of others. It carries the idea that you believe you can be successful and accomplish your goals without the counsel of anyone else. Number eight, when you're consistently critical. People who are critical are that way because they secretly see themselves as exempt from the very same things they criticize others for. That's pride. Number nine, consistent need for attention and affirmation. 10, unable to receive constructive criticism. And you see this a lot, you know, people that struggle with pride is they will oftentimes offend people and expect you to be offended, I mean, expect you to take it. And then if you say one thing back to them, they take an offense. So if somebody gave me like an analogy of this, um, like somebody backs up a huge 
dump truck of manure and dumps it on you. People that have Jezebel go dump it on you. And then if you try to like scrape it off yourself, they get mad at you and say, let it go. You just sit there in it and uh, receive it. You know, they, how dare you stand up to me and do anything to try to stand up for yourself. It's like, oh, it really hurt. Number 11, overly obsessed with their physical appearance. 12, unwilling to submit to authority. So they may outwardly submit, but inside their hearts, they're really angry. They do not want to submit. 13, they ignore people's attempts to communicate with them if they're, if they're not going to benefit them, if they can't do anything for them. We see that a lot, you know, like they won't respond to an email or a text or whatever. Like, you know what, that person's a, a peon and I'm not going to get back to them. Now, if they're like the president of a certain company, well, then I'm going to give them right back. Oh, my gosh, because it feeds their pride. They're like, oh, yeah, yeah, I'm going to look really good being a friend with this person. So, Number 14, when we justify our sin instead of admitting it. Because this is a dangerous place. Because if you're using scripture to support your behavior, then you're essentially saying that you know better than God. 15, they like to name drop all these people that are prominent positions that they're associated with. 16, they're on a different timetable than others, so they can show up late for calls and meetings and dinner and uh, make other people wait on them. They like that. Number 17, causes you to get angry easily. If anyone questions your intentions, your motives, your uh, statements, because then you'll get angry quickly. That's pride. How dare you question what I'm saying? Number 18, your inner circle of people consist of a lot of yes men and women. So if they don't agree with everything you're saying, you'll kick them off the island. You can't be part of my inner circle because you are challenging me. You know, or I'll block you on Facebook all day long. All these people that they block, you know. <laughs> um, number 19, do you think of yourself as more spiritual than others in your church? You know what? I've gone more fast than anyone here at the church. It's a very pious, you know, pharisaical type of an attitude. Number 20, do you have a touchy, sensitive spirit, easily offended? So again, easily offended, but then they offend people all day long. 21, do you avoid participating in certain events for fear of being embarrassed or looking foolish because you know you aren't going to win or look good? 22, do you avoid being around certain people because you feel inferior to them and don't feel like you measure up? 23, when's the last time you said these words to a family member, friend, or coworker? I am sorry for what I did to hurt you. I was wrong. Remember, remember Happy Days and Fonzie? He tried to say I was wrong and he couldn't say it. So, number 24, do you react to rules? Do you have a hard time being told what to do? And 25, do you worry about what others think of you, your reputation? The other thing that Leviathan does is it does cause you not to see reality the way that it really is. So if you do anything that could turn out to be bad, it will cause you to deny it, like it never happened. So when you are in a relationship with someone that's operating in Leviathan, they will make things up, like, nope, I never said that last week. You did. What? No, uh, you did. And they, and they swear by it. They'll get really angry if you don't go along with them. They're like, oh, no, I know that you said this. But you don't have any proof because you didn't record it. <laughs> you know, and so then, the, and, and, it's, and it's anything that could be a negative, they will not own it. You know, they, they have a very hard time taking responsibility for things that go bad. Or oftentimes the people of Ahab will take responsibility for like everything that goes bad. So uh, Leviathan wraps around the spine and it will twist, causing back pain, neck pain, headaches, insomnia. Uh, Cause you to get tired. Like when someone's speaking up here at church or you're going to read your Bible or a Christian book, you fall asleep like after a paragraph. <laughs> you can't stay awake. So I was like, gee, I need to go to bed tonight. I think I'll read my Bible. <laughs> you go to sleep right away because it puts you to sleep. It doesn't want you to receive anything from the Lord. So I've seen that a lot. Can cause, can cause scoliosis. Doesn't mean you're always going to have that, but you normally oftentimes will have back or neck pain. Um, fibromyalgia, I see it as being the number one reason for fibromyalgia is because it's actually literally pinching the nerves back here. And there's been some chiropractors that have uh, told me that they confirmed, yeah, that's exactly what's going on. They were like Christians, and some of them referred people to me, and they got delivered. And they didn't need to go back to the chiropractor anymore. Like, I used to go to a chiropractor all the time. I used to have headaches. I haven't been a chiropractor since 2009, so 10 years now. Other diseases and afflictions. And then also what I've learned as a correlation is if we are ever involved or anyone in our ancestry has ever been involved in any type of a secret society, where we make oaths to the enemy and not to the Lord. 
that can come down to the third and the fourth generations and afflict, and afflict us. You know, and so I, what I, what's interesting is my grandfather was a Freemason. I didn't know anything about Freemasons. And when he died, um, they had these people come up in aprons and we actually as a family walked out. I, I, I was sensing something's bad, I don't know what it is, you know. No one explained about it, nobody <laughs> talked to me about it. And I forgot about it, frankly. And then actually, when I learned this, the Lord started showing me some of the correlations, and so I actually put that in my book, Restored to Freedom. And then my brother read it, and he said, you know, Grandpa was a Freemason. I'm like, no, he wasn't. He was a farmer. I was like, no, he was a Freemason too. I'm like, well, why was he a Freemason? He was like, because business contacts. And it was helping him to sell more of his cattle and stuff like that. And I'm like, oh, okay. And I started doing some research about it. And, uh, and, and basically, the, the, there's like two different levels of Freemasons. There's the inner circle, where they do make these oaths to the enemy, which is not good. And then you have those that are on the outside. Those are in the first couple degrees, little by little. They don't, they don't feed them the whole 33 degrees within a year. It takes them over time. And it, and it does involve a lot of money. I've talked to a guy who, who actually went through it all the way, 33 degree, and then became a Shriner. All the Shriners have had to be a 33rd degree Freemason, and it is about money. Comes back, it started like with the Rothschilds over in England. There's a lot of people in England that I've actually done ministry with where they have back pain and neck pain. They have Leviathan, because this curse comes down because of the oaths and stuff that they made. And so I, I really believe that that's why I had my scoliosis and why I couldn't play basketball my seventh grade year. I had a lot of headaches all the time and stuff. And, uh, and I go to the chiropractor all the time. Well, once I went through and got myself delivered back in 2008, I haven't been to a chiropractor since. I haven't had a headache. I had one like minor headache that I prayed and it went away. But so when I when I had people come into the healing rooms, a lot of them had no clue. I didn't I didn't know. I'm like, gee, you know, we don't know what we don't know. We don't know what, what our ancestors did. But we live in a fallen world, so obviously they're sinning and there could be some sins that they did that open up the door to hurt them, come down the bloodline. So for instance, I'll share this. There was a woman from Minnesota that I was on a TV show, Lassie Broadcasting, Lester Sermall's network, back in uh, when was it? 2016, and she had like four stage lung cancer. Four stage? No, yeah, four stage lung cancer, and uh, she wanted prayer. And so, as I'm speaking to her on the phone, she's in the hospital up in Minnesota. The Lord says she has a grandfather that was involved in Freemasons. Let her know about this, about the correlation. So I asked her, I said, um, did you have a grandfather involved in Freemasons? She was like, yeah. So I explained to her the correlation. And when I did that, she's like, oh my gosh, this explains everything. She goes, I had a dream where my grandfather and Jesus were in my dream. And Jesus told me the reason I had cancer was because of my grandfather. Oh my gosh. I said, well, gee, do you have anybody else in your family that has cancer? She's like, yeah, we like all do. I'm like, huh. And so what I've learned throughout the last several years doing this is a lot of people, when they actually realize, oh my gosh, yes, we have, and there's a lot of diseases that come in because of these oaths that are made that aren't good. And I'm like, we need to take away all the legal right the enemy has. And so that's my goal, obviously, is to make people aware, and then we do whatever we need to do for ourselves personally to, to, to be responsible for things. Now, obviously, if our grandfathers did, did something that affects us, then, you know, we need the Lord to help us. You know, obviously, we don't want to take anything that they did that will come down and affect us. So, but I, what I've seen is this Leviathan spirit, it, it comes on people when they're involved in a lot of these secret societies. So, Eastern stars, something that the women do. Um, there's uh, Demolay for the boys, there's rainbows, there's a lot of things that they do. So, yeah, Boy Scouts, I've not heard anything bad about them, but other than they now have to allow homosexuality and stuff, which is not good, so. Okay, Ahabs. Ahabs do not like confronting. They'd rather just go with the flow. You know, so therefore, if a person has Jezebel, they get mad, they get angry, they're like, well, gee, if I just give in, then I won't have to face, face the wrath of an argument for an hour, two hours, three hours, a week. You know, and maybe I can still have intimacy with my spouse, because that's what the enemy will use against the person. So Ahabs want to just get along with everybody. They have a hard time being a strong spiritual leader. They have a strong desire to make everybody happy. They're afraid of being rejected. You know, they'll take responsibility for things. They don't like to, but they will. Um, they have a challenge oftentimes making decisions. They're oftentimes a very nice person, but they're too nice to let people walk all over them. 
instead of standing up. And that's exactly, that, that was what I struggled with the most, is I wanted to just get along with everybody. I wanted people to like me, you know, including my, my wife. And so it caused me to compromise from what God wanted me to do and be as a spiritual leader. And so they work together. You know, people think, well, gee, the Ahab, they're not that bad. Yes, it says in 1 Kings that Ahab did more evil in the sight of the Lord than all the other kings prior because he married Jezebel and then he tolerated her behavior. He should not have done that. Now, I will say this. You think about, um, like, for example, he wanted Naboth's vineyard. He went to Naboth, was going to buy it. He wasn't going to do anything bad to him. It was like near the palace. And uh, David said, no, I'm gonna give it to my kids, pass it on down, that's what we do. Oh, okay. So then he goes home and he pouts about it. He like doesn't eat, goes into his bedroom, cries, oh, I can't believe I can't have David's vineyard. So then Jezebel says, why? Why are you so sad? Well, I can't have David's vineyard. He won't sell it to me. So then Jezebel's like, well, I'll fix it for you, honey. Oh, you will? Oh, really? Great. Oh, I love you so much, Jezebel. So what she does is she ends up writing um, to the leaders of where Naboth lives and then signs it with the, the ring or the signet ring for um, Ahab, sends it off to the leaders and says, here's what we're going to do. We're going to take Naboth, we're going to bring him into a banquet, and then we're going to have two scoundrels lie about him and say that he blasphemed God and came against the king. And then you're going to take him outside and stone him and kill him. Oh, great plan, Jezebel. And that's exactly what happened. And then when she found out the news, she went over to Ahab. Guess what, honey? You got, you got Naboth's vineyard. Yay! So Ahab's get a benefit. They allow things to happen they shouldn't. You know, Ahab's don't normally go to the extent of killing somebody. But if they get married to somebody that is going to make things happen, then they get a benefit from that. And so... Ultimately, what happened was the Lord then told Elijah about it, and Elijah went to confront him because he was down there at uh, Naboth's vineyard, saying, yeah, I get Naboth's vineyard, yeah, yeah, you know, being happy. And so then Elijah's like, hello, you killed Naboth. And he's like, oh, well, I didn't kill him, uh, Jezebel did. <laughs> it's like, yeah, you allowed it, you know. And so because you did that, the Lord's going to take your life now. He's like, what? Oh, no. And so what did Ahab do? He actually repented. He put on sackcloth, he fasted. You know, he actually did have a, a, a changed heart. You know, Jezebel's, it's much harder for them to do that. Ahab's, it's much easier to repent for that. And so it bought him some time before he died. <laughs> he later did die, but then also the Lord said, I'm gonna take this out on his sons. And his 70 sons got their heads cut off when, when Jehu came to town and took over. So. So anyways, um, and then, da, 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 there, uh, well, I'll read this. Proverbs 6, 16 through 19. These six things the Lord hates. Hates is a strong word. Yes, seven are an abomination to him. A proud look. He hates pride. Again, got, got Lucifer kicked out. A lying tongue. That's Jezebel. So pride, proud look is the Leviathan. Lying tongue is Jezebel. Hands that shed innocent blood, Jezebel. A heart that devises wicked plans, Jezebel. Feet that are swift and running to evil, Jezebel. A false witness who speaks lies, Jezebel. And one who sows discord among brethren, Jezebel. Um, I'll also say this, is if we don't get delivered from pride, that can stop us from our healings. Think about Naaman. Naaman had leprosy. He wanted to get healed. So... His daughter tells him to go to Elisha. So just go to Elisha, you know. And uh, he was expecting Elisha just to say, okay, you're healed. And that didn't happen because Elisha knew that he was dealing with pride. So he said, you go down to the filthy, dirty Jordan River and wash off seven times, and then you'll get your healing. And he was very prideful. He's like, I'm not doing that. If I'm gonna go to any river, I'm gonna go to the Columbia River, you know, <laughs> some clean river. He's like, no, no, no. And he didn't say Columbia, so I just let you know. It was another river there over there in, uh, in Israel. So, uh, so anyway, he said, um, okay, I will humble myself and go to the filthy, dirty um, Jordan River. And I've been actually baptized in the Jordan River and you know, they do have rats and stuff there. I mean, it's, it's not clean. So he did that seven times, and then he got his healing. So what I've seen, you know, and I had a healing room. The Lord told me, I want people to go through this 
every time because there are people that have a lot of pride and that will stop them from the healings. If I were to heal them, you know, that will oftentimes make them operate in more pride. Like, oh, look at me. I can be even more prideful now <laughs> without the pain. <laughs> you know, so the Lord, want, we have to do everything that uh, responsibly for what the Lord, to become more Christ-like. And when you go through deliverance, you do become more Christ-like. The fruit starts to smell good. Um, and I'll say this, um, James 4.10 says, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. James 4.6, God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. And um, Galatians, Galatians 5, 16 to 26. I say then, walk in the spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things that you wish. And that's a lot of us. A lot of us struggle with things. We're like, gee, I wish I could stop doing this addiction, and I can't do it. Well, it's because if the enemy keeps tempting you all the time and it has a legal right, then we may have to humble ourselves. We may have to completely forgive and then we could go through the deliverance. We don't hear that enemy tempting us all the time. So what I've seen is the people that operate, you know, with Jezebel, Leviathan more than the Ahab, but uh, they will oftentimes operate in these works of the flesh. So it goes on and says, but if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, which is being unholy, lewdness, which is sexually impure, lustful, idolatry, you put anything before the Lord, sorcery, which is witchcraft, which is a high level, Jezebel, hatred, you know, how many people do we know that hate? How many people that have contentions, contentions and strife and jealousies, outbursts of wrath, Selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies. There's a lot of people in the church that behave like that. Envy can even get to murder, drunkenness, revelries. But it says, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. So the Lord knows who we are behind closed doors. And if we're struggling with not having peace, not seeing a lot of the fruit of the spirit, then we're hearing the voice of the enemy. So it says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, which is patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. And those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, which is pride, provoking one another, which is exactly what those spirits do, and envying one another. So that's Galatians 5, 16 to 26. And then Jeremiah 17, 10 says, I, the Lord, search the heart, I test the mind, even to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his doings. And that comes to Matthew 7, 21 to 23. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name. Then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness, which is sin, which is the flesh. So what we see is when people go through deliverance, they transform, they become a different person. They renew their minds, <clears throat> and they're able to discern the enemy. <clears throat> they don't fight, they don't strive, they don't argue with their spouse, with their children. And then the hearts, the Malachi 4, 5, and 6 prophecy, where it says, I'm sending Elijah before the great and great day of the Lord to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, children of the fathers, lest I come and you know, send the curse. That's what we're seeing. We're seeing entire families that are getting delivered. And then they love each other. They get together for the holidays and they laugh and they have fun. Nobody says something to hurt their children and then blame the children for not taking it you know, and offending. They have a good time. They enjoy themselves. They change. You know, I change dramatically. I mean, all these people that have gone through this have changed. Not, I mean, not everybody. There's people that are still wanting to change, but they haven't done it yet. You know, God gives us a free will, so we can choose to keep the spirits if you want. If you don't mean it with your heart, it's not going to work because the enemy has a legal right to stay. If you really mean it and say, okay, I don't want any of this in me. I really mean this, Lord. And you go through that, and that's what we're going to be doing next. Um, you're going to see a lot of miracles that will happen. You'll have more peace. You'll hear the Lord's voice more clearly. You'll see healings. 
Um, you'll get along with people. You'll discern it. You'll discern it in other people. Like a lot of times people get delivered, they're like, oh, now I can see this on other people. I couldn't see it before. Oh my gosh, Jezebel, Ahab, Ahab, Jezebel, Jezebel, Ahab. All these relationships, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, it's true. Whereas before we were like, you don't know what it is. No, I didn't know what it was. Like I get my haircuts at sport clips wherever I go around the United States and Canada because they take a little longer, like half an hour to cut it. And so invariably they ask me what I do. So I explain to them, you know, I, I start off like, I used to sell software to banks. And I was like, I deliver people from demons. That'd be kind of weird. <laughs> so I, I just tell people, um, I help people get have more peace that have had pains from their fathers and mothers and step parents and sexual violations. Like, well, that's good. And then I explain about the spirit a little bit. And then they're like cutting my hair, getting closer to me saying, oh my gosh, you're describing like my mom or my dad or me or my spouse. This explains everything. And I'm like, it does explain a lot, doesn't it? Like they want to get set free, then we really are free. And we really are becoming more Christ-like at that point. So, And we have to continue to press in. I mean, you may, basically, you want to press in at that point. You're like, I'm a different person now. Oh my gosh, I feel so much peace. And I'll say this, that oftentimes when the spirits lift, it's like there's a fogginess. You have more clarity when your, your vision actually will clear up. You can see things more clearly. The colors are more brighter. Um, we had one guy who was in Billings. He had an accident, a car accident, where a woman hit him. He was, I think, parked, and she hit him at going like 50 or 60 or something like that. He had broken his back, broken his spine. His hip was shifted 28 degrees, I believe. He was on codeine, morphine since 2012, constant pain. And he came on a Friday night, got delivered, and then that night he didn't take his painkilling medication. And he woke up the next morning, had no pain. He came in that night, at the afternoon, and actually the, the video is on YouTube, you can see him. He bends over and touches his nose to his knees. I can't do that, you know. He said, because I have more flexibility now than I had before the accident. He goes, and he was like walking normal, and he's like, I have no pain at all. He goes, this is amazing. He said, I could feel Leviathan unwrap from my spine, and I could feel my hips start to shift in direct. But we, we saw that last night. I was at a home in... Uh, Tiger, right? That's how you pronounce it, Tiger. And uh, there's like several people said, like, oh my gosh, I could feel my neck, you know, the, the pain it was, or it was popping into place. Or I could feel my hips shifting a little bit. Or I could feel a leg that's growing that's shorter than the other leg. Oh my gosh, this is really cool. I'm like, oh, I know, it's way better than normal church, you know? Because, <laughs> I mean, I, we've seen a lot of cool, supernatural, awesome things that are just fun, you know? And so, anyway. So what we're going to do is for all those of you that can stand, we're going to have everybody stand, and we're going to take our authority. And I'm going to lead you through some prayers. You just mean it with your heart. You know, nothing weird is going to happen. I'm going to take authority first of all and make sure that, you know, everybody is at peace. Everybody is uh, without any fear or worry, and you're going to feel a lot more peace, have a lot more joy, and uh, it's going to be awesome. And there's people watching on Facebook Live, but they're watching me, so no worries. You're not on Facebook Live, so... Um, but there's people that watch all over the world and we see miracles that happen, so. Again, I just say, you know, mean it with your heart because the enemy knows if you don't mean it or not. I've seen kids as young as five years of age that have gotten delivered. In fact, we have a children's deliverance video on YouTube for like, it's like a 28 minute video and kids have gotten delivered. I had one girl, she went to uh, uh, a, a trip, uh, it was a church trip, mission, uh, no, it was a mission, it was a, well, I don't, it was a church trip to Colorado. She lived in College Station, Texas. She was touched inappropriately by a leader. And uh, for two years, she was a mess. No drugs could fix her. It was in all kinds of psychologists and stuff. Nothing would work. And then actually went to her house and prayed, commanded the spirits to be gone from her because she was, in fact, she was so bad. She was 11 years old. She had written a paper that week where she was describing how she was gonna dismember the body parts of her mother and she hated her son, her brother, who was like nine. And so when she got delivered, they actually went to the park and she was holding her mom's hand again. She was being loving and sweet again. And uh, her mom like called me the next day and said, oh my gosh, she's a different person. I'm like, I know, just like my son. When my son was 18 and he was a mess for 10 years, I said, and then I prayed for him and he was a changed person overnight. I could talk to him and he was respectful and calm. So. That's the anointing the Lord is uh, got on tonight. And so expect something. And we're going to pray for our loved ones. Because this happened in Billings. There was a man that did not want his wife to come. She had Ahab, he had Jezebel. And she came. 
And when she went home, he was a changed man. And of course, I'm always like, well, we have to see this over time because people can be nice for a short period of time. And so it was like about eight days later, he was still being nice. I'm like, okay, well, let's give it a month, you know. I go, then I would like to talk to the guy because I want to know how that happened. Because normally the person has to be here. But I said, if the Lord's going to give an anointing where we can actually help loved ones get delivered that are, are being strong Jezebels, and that's a really big anointing and miracle. I want that. So we also want to take authority over our loved ones as well. And I, I let me know if they've changed because you'll know it. I mean, the people that know, you know, I've been around those people, they know if there's been a change or not. You know, I knew immediately that my son, it was the next day, uh, he actually came out of the house and said, hey, Dad, can I finish mowing the grass for you? He hadn't mowed the grass for like three years. He would never willingly do it. And he's like, oh, can I also get a haircut and apply for a job at Burger King? I was like, oh, my gosh, you got fired from Kroger like the year before. And it's like you couldn't, he's like herding cats, you know. He was not, you know, he was hearing the voice of the enemy strongly. But after he got delivered, he was a changed person. I mean, I, I can show you a picture as well. I'll show you that at the end if you want to see it. Um, all right, so here we go. I'm going to take authority first of all. So thank you, Heavenly Father, right now. I take authority over any um, enemy spirits on anyone right now. In Jesus' name, I shut you down. I declare no manifestations. In Jesus' name, I charge the angels over all of us. Give us peace, love, and joy, and just let the Holy Spirit flow and direct. In Jesus' name, amen. So what I'm going to do is have you go through, I'll lead you through the prayers, basically. And you're taking your authority doing this, so. Because um, ultimately, you have, you know, a free will. You can choose to do this or not, so. We don't make you and uh, bend your arm, but you want to do this, so. <laughs> no downside. <coughs> so here we go. We're going to first of all, break off generational curses. Then we're going to come against Jezebel. Then Leviathan. Then Ahab. Then Legion. Then break off witchcraft curses. Legion, by the way causes us to have a lot of discouraging thoughts about things in the past that did not go the way that they should. So it keeps us in the tombs, stuck in the tombs of the past, like the guy that had legion, you know, when Jesus cast him into the pigs and 2,000 pigs went on down into the Sea of Galilee. And uh, so there's about 6,000 demons in the legion, um, which is like what there is in a Roman soldier regiment or whatever they call them, but 6,000, that's why they call it legion. And then we're going to break off witchcraft curses because I, I want to take away every legal right that there possibly could be on a person to hurt them. And I, there's 1.5 million witches that they call themselves Christian witches or white witches that are in the church that are like, they want to get into leadership teaching. Some of them are on Facebook. A lot of them want to touch people and, uh, you know, I'll pray for you. I'll pray for you. And they act sweet and nice. And it's really hard to discern. I mean, it really is. It's like they can deceive a lot of people. And so we're going to break off witchcraft curses on people tonight. And I've seen a big anointing on that as well. That came upon me back in uh, November, December. And we've seen some really good successes with that. So here we go. Um, just repeat after me. Say, thank you, Heavenly Father. I break off every generational curse that has had any legal right to affect me. I forgive all my ancestors for any sins they have done to hurt me. I give them to the Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, now I take authority, I pray right now, and I break off every generational curse all the way back to Adam and Eve from everyone in Jesus' name. I declare now that the curses are null and void against you, will have no more effect in Jesus' name. We just release peace now over you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. I'll take about five seconds. Take some deep breaths. You start to feel a little bit more peace. And then the next one I'm going to do is Jezebel. And, uh, and some of you have been yawning. I'm here. I've been seeing you. So <laughs> you may yawn more going through Jezebel, Leviathan, Ahab, and Legion. So. And I might yawn too. Because I did these, do like thousands of these individual sessions on Facebook Messenger video. And I used to yawn a lot when I took people through that. So. Yeah, it's just like a, the way the Lord's showing it's being released, it's going. So here we go, Jezebel. Say, thank you, Heavenly Father. Thank you, Heavenly Father. I repent for all that I have done to hurt people. And I want nothing to do with the spirit of Jezebel. So I choose to forgive my father for anything he's done to hurt me. So 
and I choose to forgive my father for all that he didn't do to protect me. I choose to forgive my mother for anything that she's done to hurt me. And I also choose to forgive my mother for all that she didn't do to protect me. Okay, now I'm going to pray. Let the Holy Spirit show you other people in your life that have hurt you that you need to forgive. So Holy Spirit, right now, show them all those that have hurt them in their lives. All those uh, include, I just, I see siblings, I see stepfathers, stepmothers, I see teachers, I see spouses, ex-spouses, uncles, grandparents, pastors, pastors' wives, intercessors, worship leaders. So Holy Spirit, now show them why those people hurt them so they can see that those people were hurt too. And that's the only reason why they did that. So that they can have grace for them and to forgive them completely from their hearts. Okay, now what I want you to do is to say, I choose to forgive in the name of the first names of all that the Holy Spirit's shown you. And I'm gonna pray in tongues so that uh, you can do it uh, in anonymity if you like to, but just to say, I choose to forgive. And then, and if you are married, make sure you say the name of your spouse, because I guarantee your spouse has hurt you. <laughs> you cannot not be married and not have <laughs> someone that's, you know, so here, unless you were married to Jesus, which that would be kind of weird. So <laughs> here we go. All right, next I want you to symbolically pull a knife out of your heart. Now the song that we last sang there talked about our heart being in pieces. Oftentimes it's what it feels like when you've gone through such betrayal and hurt and pain. So we're gonna pull the knife out of our heart that represents all those pains that you've ever gone through. And then you're gonna throw the knife down to the cross, to the foot of the cross, to Jesus, to take all that pain and give you all his gain. You know, he died on the cross for us. Take away all that pain. And then I want you to now reach up to heaven for a new heart that's never been hurt before. And then I want you to put that now into your heart and then say, thank you, Heavenly Father, for my new heart that's never been hurt before. I declare that I will serve you with my new heart all of my days on earth. I ask you, Lord, to help me see myself as you see me and to walk in holiness, purity, and righteousness. In Jesus' name, amen. Now I take authority in Jesus' name. I command the spirit of Jezebel and any demon that reports to you to be gone right now. I command you to go to hell. I declare that you will never come back on them again. And we just release Heavenly Father, just purity, righteousness, and holiness. Let them see themselves as you see them, Lord. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Now take about 10 seconds. Take some deep breaths and relax. You should feel lighter, maybe more peaceful. And again, what I see is uh, from some of you, what's going to happen is that your childlike innocence that was stolen is going to be restored to you. You're going to have fun. You're going to be like one to skip rope and jump and go and have fun and go swinging. And because that's like, that's what I become. I become like a little boy again. There's been people say, man, you're like a little boy. You have fun all the time. And I'm like, I know. I go, it's awesome when you go through deliverance. It's amazing. Because when you don't go through deliverance, the enemy wants to cause you to be taking an offense and be serious and be angry and, and remember all the horrible things people have done to you. 
And when you get set free and delivered, man, you have dogs that walk up to you on the beach and say, I want to play fetch with you. And I'm like, who the heck are you, dog? You know, It's like, oh my gosh, you just dropped the stick right in front of me. And I'm like, there's like a million people there at the beach and it could have been any of them. But it's so cool. It's so fun. So okay, the next thing is the spirit of Leviathan. And oftentimes that's the biggest results you'll see when that spirit goes from your back and your neck. And so you might feel some things shifting, which is awesome. And you have more flexibility and stuff. So here we go. Say, thank you, Heavenly Father. Thank you, Father. I repent for my pride. Repent for my pride. And, I you, Lord, and I ask you, Lord, to give me a humble and contrite spirit. And now I command the spirit of Leviathan to go to hell in Jesus' name and to never torment me again. Amen. Okay, now I take authority. I command the spirit of Leviathan to unwrap from your spine, the head, body, and tail right now. Be unwrapped from your spine. I command you to go to hell. Any demon that reports to you, we command you to all be gone in Jesus' name. And now I speak to your spines. I command your spines to be aligned perfect now. From the top of your C curve to the lower lumbar, we command every disc to pop into perfect position, perfect place in Jesus' name. And any traumas that you've suffered, car accidents, sporting, falls, right now I just command the cellular memory to be forgotten from those impacts in Jesus' name. I also command the hips now to shift into perfect position in Jesus' name. Any legs that you have that are shorter than the other, we command to grow out to be the same length in Jesus' name. We command your arms to be the same length, everything to be symmetrically perfect in Jesus' name. We command all tightness and tension be gone from your neck and your shoulders in Jesus' name. We declare that you will never have another headache ever again in Jesus' name. We declare that when you sleep tonight, you'll sleep soundly, that you will have good dreams, that you will remember those dreams, and the Holy Spirit will give you the interpretation of those dreams when you awake. We also declare that when you read the word, read the, the Bible and Christian books and hear it preached, that you will stay awake now and that you will retain everything that you hear and that you read in Jesus' name. And I just speak 100% health and wholeness now throughout every cell in your body in Jesus' name. And we just release Heavenly Father, just a humble and contrite spirit, Lord. We thank you, Father, in Jesus' name, amen. Now, uh, take about 15 seconds, and if you want to, you can twist and just see. You know, some, and some of you, like last night, people were feeling stuff pop. Like some people like, pop, 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 pop. They could actually feel it like, this is so cool. This is amazing. And, uh, and you could feel, I mean, oftentimes you'll feel lighter, and you may feel like there's a cloud been lifted from your eyes, like the scale's been removed from your eyes, so you can see clearer. I can see clearly now. The rain is gone. <laughs> I can see all the, in fact, I did a Facebook Live on that once, yes, it's like, I was trying to incorporate the 70s and 80s songs into my teaching, so, the, the appropriate ones, not the uh, Kiss songs and, uh, <laughs> and Alice Cooper and stuff, <laughs> although I think he became a Christian, didn't he? I think Alice Cooper actually did, I think that's right, and that's just hard to imagine, it's like, what? <laughs> So, next is Ahab. We want to get rid of the Ahab spirit. People are like, oh, that's not so bad. I'm like, yes, it is. Because Ahab's just tolerate everything because we want to get along with everybody. Jesus couldn't tolerate everything, you know. And I've learned, you know, I've gotten delivered from this. Now, I will stand up and I will speak when I need to. I will do it in love. We should always be in love, you know, but I'll have to be firm, you know, sometimes. So, uh, anyways, we're going to get rid of Ahab. So, here we go. Let's say, thank you, Heavenly Father. I want nothing to do with the spirit of Ahab. So I ask you, Lord, to give me boldness and confidence. Let me see myself as you see me. And I will not tolerate any spirits of the enemy anymore. In Jesus' name, amen.
Okay, now I take authority, I command the spirit of Ahab to go to hell in Jesus' name. I declare it will never come back on you again. And we just release now boldness and confidence. I declare that you are a mighty man or woman of valor in Jesus' name. I declare that you also have the scales removed from your eyes so that you can see these on other people and that you will be bold enough and loving enough to help them get set free and pass this on in Jesus' name. I declare that you have a new level of discernment now like you've never had before, and that you hear the Lord's voice more clearly than ever before, in Jesus' name. Thank you, Father. Amen and amen. Now, take another 15 seconds, take some deep breaths, and some of you might feel like you've lost 10 pounds. You know, some of you are dancing this week. <laughs> you're having fun. You're like, ah, this is so cool. And nobody's vomiting. Imagine that. So that's, that's the coolest thing for me, because I'm like, I would not do this. And, and, Obviously, there's people, I mean, the, the demons like to do that to people to cause people not to get delivered, so. But, you know, I, I've seen visions, the Lord showed me, of entire stadiums going through these prayers and getting delivered in a normal, calm way. You know, can you imagine 50,000 people going through this? Oh, my gosh, that's awesome, so. All right, so next is the spirit of legion. Again, when you get freed from the legion, oftentimes legion causes a lot of sickness too in our bodies. It keeps reminding us of all the failures in the past. There was one woman, before she got delivered, she kept talking about her ex-husband from like 50 years before. He did this wrong, this wrong, this wrong, and she would keep repeating it. And people are like, really, seriously? You've gone through this like 100,000 times. Let it go, you know, forgive. And so we have to forgive those that hurt us, you know, and um, that's the big part of that. But what will happen is you will, you will notice you're not going to have those voices keep discouraging you, remind you of all the failures, you know, you should have done this, or you're, you hear oftentimes your dad's voice or your mom's voice reminding you about all the things you didn't do right. And then oftentimes you can hear them in their voices. They're like, oh my gosh, there it is again. So here we go. Say, thank you, Heavenly Father. Thank you, Heavenly Father. I now choose to forgive, I now choose to forgive everyone, everyone that has ever hurt me. Ever hurt me. I give them to you. I want nothing to do with the spirit of legion. So I ask you, Lord, to take it away now. In Jesus' name. Okay, now I take authority. I command the spirit of legion and all 6,000 demons to be gone. In Jesus' name, we send you to hell. We declare that you will never come back on them again. And now we speak 100% health and wholeness through it, every cell in their body. In Jesus' name. We thank you, Heavenly Father God, that now they will be encouraged by the Holy Spirit. They will hear the Lord's voice in Jesus' name. No more discouraging thoughts. If the enemy tries to speak uh, even three words, they will shut him down in Jesus' name. They will not entertain a thought from the enemy anymore. I thank you, Father God, for their extreme level of discernment now in Jesus' name. And that, uh, yes, we do release and forgive all those that have hurt us in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Take 15 seconds again, take some deep breaths, relax. Anyone feeling lighter? Yes. Anyone feel stuff like move from your back and spine and stuff? Really? Yeah, Isn't that cool? I mean, that is so awesome. I'm like, that's the way church should be, you know, is <laughs> have awesome, cool things that uh, are supernatural that the Lord does. So that's amazing. Okay, the last thing is we're to break off witchcraft curses. And again, I didn't even want to think about witches cursing people or being in the church for that matter. And then when I started getting revealed all this stuff back in November, December, I was like, oh my gosh. In fact, there was an article, I think it was uh, Jonathan Kahn, Rabbi Jonathan Kahn release, where it talked about 1.5 million witches are in the church, Wicca, and things like that. Um, and they're practicing. And they, they call themselves, you know, Christians. And they're like, no, they're not. They get their power from Satan. It's not good. And, and if you ever cross them and not do what they want, they'll curse you. And they can cause, like, tiredness so you don't have any energy. They can cause headaches. They can cause um, drowsiness. They can cause back pain, neck pain, sciatic pains, things that you go to the doctors for that nothing works. You're like, the doctor can't do anything. You know, it tries this, tries this, because they're constantly doing these dual cur curses, incantations, and they're effective because of the stuff that they've learned from the enemy side. So, in fact, I remember actually I did a, uh, the Lord told me to go in <coughs> to do some research on how to become a witch. And I'm like, I don't want to do that. And the Lord's like, you need to know. And it said that 
um, the biggest number one way to become a witch is it was the intent of a person's heart. I'm like, ah, same thing as the Lord knows the intent of our heart. And that's what really makes the difference. We can fool a lot of people and act all good in front of the church, but if we go home and we torment things, then that's not good. So I, I have noticed that I've had some more people that have been in witchcraft that have come to these deliverance sessions and the Lord is wanting them to get set free. And again, they're only doing that because they've been hurt so deeply, oftentimes by people in the church. Like, I'm going to pay them back. I'm going to curse those in the church. And so, here we go. Say, thank you, Heavenly Father. Thank you, Heavenly Father. I, forgive I forgive all those who have spoken curses over me. I ask you, Lord, to forgive me for speaking curses over others. I repent for anything that I have done that has hurt other people. And I ask you, Lord, for protection for me and my family members all the way down my bloodline from any curses from anyone from the enemy. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, now I break off now all witchcraft curses against you in Jesus' name. I declare that they are null and void, and any demons that were sent on assignment through those curses are now sent to hell in Jesus' name. I release now health and wholeness throughout your body in Jesus' name. I release peace over your mind in Jesus' name. I release joy. I release laughter. I release fun in Jesus' name. I thank you, Heavenly Father God. Purify them, Lord. Burn out everything that's from the enemy, Lord, in the name of Jesus. And I declare that you are restored to freedom in Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Yay! And, and nobody bothered. Now what we're going to do is we're going to go after all of our family members now. Because that's the last thing the Lord wants us to do. So here we go. Say, thank you, Heavenly Father. I ask you, Lord, to speak to the hearts of all my loved ones. Let them see the truth. Let them understand how the enemies hurt them. So that they can choose to forgive and repent for their pride. So I ask you, Lord, right now to heal and restore them to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, now I take authority right now. And I break off all enemy spirits from every one of our loved ones in Jesus' name. We declare right now that they are now in their right minds in Jesus' name. That they have peace. That they have joy. Again, we charge the angels on assignment to complete this work in Jesus' name. And we thank you, Heavenly Father God, that we will get phone calls. That we will get uh, personal appearances uh, by our loved ones and we will know that we know that we know when they have changed they will be different people we will see their countenances will change but they will be loving i uh, thank you heavenly father god also i speak a blessing over all lord tonight that lord when they go out of this room lord that they will be completely changed forever i thank you father that they will continue to press in to become more christ-like every single day in jesus name i declare that you will bless them lord financially lord because when our hearts become like christ he can trust us and he will increase our finances because when we do get blessed, we will use it more for kingdom purposes, not just for our own selfish gain. So I thank you, Heavenly Father. Just bless them. We, we, we speak divine health over their bodies in Jesus' name. Let them know that they know their, their authority in Christ, Lord. In Jesus' name, I declare that they are pure and spotless in every way. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 All righty. Thank you very much. You can sit down. I'm going to Go through real quickly the books and um, and then I guess how are you going to end this, um, Tammy? So, Restored to Freedom. This is the 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 I guess the bestseller, the first book that I wrote. This is specifically written to give to people that struggle with Jezebel and Leviathan and Legion, those that are tending to be more prideful, that are harder to get through to. So if you can get this in their hands, oftentimes without them knowing that you gave it to them. Because they may take an offense, you know, if you're like, well, you think I have this spirit. Da, da, da. So you have to be sneakier than those spirits. So it may have to appear suddenly, like in their mailbox or in their front door or somehow. And some people have mailed it 
like from friends from like Florida mailing it back to a person that lives in the same state or city that they are in. Um, so they can call a person that's in different cities and then when it shows up and comes, the person has no idea. What? How, what's this? Restored to freedom. Huh. And, it, and because it doesn't say Jezebel on the first page or the table of contents, it talks about, have you ever had you know, pain in your, as a life, as you're growing up, have you ever had strife or pain as a child in your family? Did your father or mother love you unconditionally? You ever feel rejected? You ever experience any appropriate sexual encounters? So it's targeted to get them to be drawn into it, to start reading it. And then the Holy Spirit is all throughout the book. So we'll actually show them father wounds, mother wounds in the first chapter, sexual violations. It talks about character issues. And then as they keep reading it, then it's not until like the fifth chapter I talk about the Jezebel spirit. And then by then they're ready to keep on reading because they're like, oh my gosh, this is me, this is me. And then I have the prayers to get delivered from that, Jezebel, Leviathan, and Legion. And then I have a book for the Ahabs called Waking the Lion Within. So again, this is a great, you know, for, for people that are married, they're great for anybody really. But uh, this will help people that are Ahabs to become stronger in who they are in Christ. Um, Yes, I will tell you that. Um, and then pure and spotless is, are you ready for Christ's return? So a lot of times I was brought up thinking, well, I'm good to go, you know, but then I was still struggling with things. And so the character, the behaviors and stuff weren't lining up with what the fruit of the spirit was supposed to be. And there's a lot of people in the church today that they, they hear a message that's really kind of the ultra grace or hyper grace message, which has gotten way off to where you know, God loves you no matter what you do. You can keep on sinning, and uh, you don't even have to ask for forgiveness anymore. He knows you're going to sin anyway. So it's like, no, that shouldn't be our aspiration. Our aspiration should be towards holiness and righteousness, you know, as best we can. It doesn't mean we're going to be perfect or anything. We're going to still mess up. But if we mess up, you know, hopefully there'll be less than what we used to mess up. And But the Lord will then say, okay, I see your heart. Your heart is intentionally wanting to pursue me, and I love you. I love that about you. You know, and he loves us all, but if we end up having pride and we operate in the spirits of Jezebel and Leviathan, people that have told me when he got delivered, you know what, I wouldn't have gone to heaven if I died. I was not really good. <laughs> I mean, people at church would have thought I was good. I could pray, I could prophesy, you know, I could pray in tongues, but man, I was really bad to my spouse and my kids. And then they got delivered, they were like, I'm a new person, praise God. Choosing a godly mate, so if you're single, this is a great book to help you not choose a mate because oftentimes mates will act a certain way before you say I do and once you say I do they change sometimes instantly I know what that's like and it's not fun so this makes sure that you get delivered yourself and then when you're getting ready to marry it also tells you some red flags to look for to make sure that that person is really being honest with you because they'll oftentimes I've seen this where they will become who they think you want like especially on Facebook, they will see all your likes and all your dislikes, and then all of a sudden they have a like towards baseball when they really hate baseball. But because you like baseball, they're going to start, oh, I love baseball, start making posts on Facebook, baseball, baseball, baseball is great. You know, and then you end up getting married, like I will never go with you to a game. What? But you, you liked it before we got, uh, what? I was lying, you know? <laughs> so there's a lot of flags to look for to make sure, because you, it's really important because the enemy wants to bring together Jezebels and Ahabs. He wants to keep doing that. And so when we get delivered, we become different people. Jesus loves to heal through you. Again, I learned about my authority about 10 years ago, and it's changed my life. I didn't even know I could do what Christ said we could do in the Bible. And uh, it's changed my life to pray with authority in Jesus' name, to expect the same things that Jesus expected. So I've seen um, great health since then. Keep your peace on. Now, a lot of people say, that's the best book I wrote. I did this actually in four days because the Holy Spirit gave me the whole book in four days. So it was crazy. It was like I started writing this on a Friday and it was on Amazon by the next Friday. And what it really is, is I work with people who are half a billionaires, people that are actors and act, uh, actresses, people that are supermodels, uh, FBI agents, um, Navy SEALs, and all of us, you know, down below them. Doesn't matter how much money or how famous you are, if you don't have peace, you have torment. I work with one guy who was worth a half a billion dollars. 
he had no peace. He was hurt by his dad who worked a lot to make more money all the time. And uh, it wasn't until he got delivered that he actually found the peace. He was tormented like worse than anybody I'd ever had met. What's the name of that one? Keep your peace on. And so this will help you to discern throughout the day the various ways that the circumstances that the enemy tries to come against you with and to be on to his tactics. Same thing with the thoughts that you may have. You, know, you could be driving down the road, five here, and then somebody cuts you off and you get angry. Oh my gosh, you did horrible, you cut me off. Da, da. You lost your peace. You know, don't take an offense ever. That's the bait of Satan, obviously. And so we can't be offended about anything. You know, just you know, think about, you know, throughout the day, how many times we lose our peace. And then sometimes it could last for a whole week. You can get into fear all the time. The enemy really wants us to get into fear a lot. False evidence appearing real, I say. So when you start to get onto the enemy's tactics throughout the day, then all of a sudden you get to have more peace and more peace and more peace. And then I walk in peace all the time. Uh, it doesn't matter what somebody does to me or lies about me. I'm like, I'm not gonna change my peace. You know, the enemy hates that when people have peace too, by the way. You may have people that have Jezebel that are getting really mad at you. If they're yelling and screaming at you, you're just like, they're like, you're supposed to be afraid of me. What are you doing? You can't be happy. I'm happy. <laughs> um, in fact, uh, do you, do you uh, remember the movie Unplanned that just came out like a month ago, Unplanned about abortion? <laughs> my friend, um, my friend uh, Robia Scott is in that movie. She plays the bad girl, Cheryl, for Planned Parenthood. And, um, but she's really good. And uh, her husband coined the term, when you're taking an offense, you are the one that's off and you put up a fence. And I'm like, that's really good. I like that, that's true. You know, so we're supposed to be unoffendable. So anyway, keep your peace on, you know, no matter what happens to you throughout the day, don't let yourself lose your peace. Because once you lose your peace, you may be not having peace for a while because the enemy's gonna keep pinging you, pinging you, pinging you with thoughts. And then if you don't think about and take those thoughts captive, then enemy's got you. And it could be for a long time, it could be for a lifetime, so. Loving like Christ, how to love the hard to love people in your life. People that have Jezebel that refuse to get delivered, they're hard to love. And so this uh, gives a lot of examples in the Bible of people like, remember Hosea and Gomer? You know, she cheated on him and then she left him and then he had to buy her back at an auction. Uh, so I give a lot of examples here. Um, even Moses, remember all the people that hated him and he's leading them and he's talking to God because they're all chicken, don't wanna go up there and talk to God. So. You know, he had like, you know, what, over a million people. And then he had to go into the desert with them until they all died out. And then, then he ended up not being able to go to the promised land. But loving like Christ, how to love the hard to love people. Sometimes the Lord gives you an assignment and it may be for a certain season. And it may be a lot harder than what you ever thought. And you may have to bite your tongue a lot. I've learned about biting my tongue because everything in the enemy and my flesh wanted to say something to somebody. The Lord said, you know, because they were wrong. The Lord said, no, they can't receive it. If you say something to them, you're going to hurt them and you will not have a relationship with them anymore. So sometimes you just have to bite your tongue if they can't receive it yet. And then keep your faith on changing your life from ordinary to extraordinary. I give a lot of examples about children and um, spouses and finances and uh, health, um, how to when things don't look like there's no possible way, even going to court, I've been to court um, several times against um, people that had attorneys and I didn't have an attorney. I had God be my attorney. And he actually overturned a couple of judges' decisions for me, which was amazing because I didn't get into fear and worry. So, and then the last one is the School of Ministry. This is a training curriculum. This is basically a guide. If you want to help others get delivered, then this is a great guide. This is. This is $5, the rest are $10 each. If you get seven of these, you can get them for $60. If you get everything, it's uh, $75. And we can take credit card, debit card. If you make a checkout, it's to restore to freedom. And I think that's it. So I'll turn it back over to you, Tammy. Are they still here? Yes, they're back there. Do you recommend your workbook? Yeah, I'll talk to you about that back. We're going to hand around the, um, the bucket for offering to give Nelson Schumann an offering. If everybody could give them the best that they have.
He has come and blessed us tonight. And we just want